so welcome. And what I'm going to do is turn it over to Bob Latino to do our introduction for today. So Bob, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Dean. And, uh, for me, this is a very special guest this month uh, with Michelle Lede Henley because uh, we, we essentially grew up together. Our, uh, our fathers were uh, icons in the reliability engineering industries. Uh, oddly enough, they, they competed against each other. One was Allied Chemical and one was DuPont, and they both made carpet fibers and competed against each other. But uh, they, they both were stalwarts in the uh, area of emerging reliability in the uh, late 70s and the early 80s. So, um, you know, they also created uh, something called the manufacturing game. Uh, for those of our friends who are uh, in attendance that have played that over the past 40 years, and tens of thousands of people around the world have played it. Uh, that also comes from uh, Michelle's family, and uh, she is now the uh, she now facilitates and runs the the manufacturing game as well, uh, which we do uh, various projects together. But I'm I'm really excited that she's uh, agreed to go ahead and uh, do one of our webinars this month, as I try to bring and uh, our reliability and maintenance communities from our world over here into the hop communities because uh, the, the principles are a very good marriage. So with that, I will toss it over. Dana, do I toss it to her or do I toss it back to you? Michelle, the floor is yours and I'll just do a quick, well, it's almost yours. Everybody, you know, please feel free throughout the, the discussion today to chat um, into the chat box and Bob and I will keep an eye on that. If you have a question or a comment or a thought that you'd like to share and then we'll um, politely and respectfully um, interrupt Michelle at convenient points and let you then and, and share your question or your thought. But with that, Michelle, it is all yours. All right. Thank you guys so much. I'm, I'm excited to uh, be joining this community and, and having a chance to participate. I'm looking forward to, to getting a lot more involved because as Bob said, I think there's a lot of overlap between the things that the hop community is doing and the folks that are in the, the world of maintenance and reliability are doing. Um, let me just jump right in and see if I can manage to screen share. Let's see. Bob, is you it got up? It. Got yes, it? there. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be talking today. My, my uh, presentation title is Spreadsheets or Stories, What Really Creates a Reliability Culture. And let me start with just a uh, little bit of background here on myself. Um, I'm president of TNG Frontline Solutions, a company that nobody's ever heard of. We're much better known by our primary product, which Bob mentioned is the manufacturing game. Uh, we focus on engaging everyone in an organization and eliminating defects to improve reliability at their site. We work with uh, chemical plants, oil refineries, gas transmission lines, uh, plants that make diapers, plants that make pharmaceuticals, basically anyone who has large equipment and the reliability of that equipment is important to their process. Those are, are our clients. And uh, we do this using a simulation that's actually a physical board game. So four feet by five feet, poker chips, fake money, dice, the whole nine yards. Uh, I believe very firmly that improvements in order to be sustainable need to need to happen basically as close to where the work happens. So in my case, it's it's by the equipment. Um, and, and it has to happen in the people that are closest to that equipment. And if it doesn't happen there, if you're not engaging your frontline workforce, whatever changes you implement through just the, the management or supervision level, uh, it may have some success for a while, but, but it's unlikely to be sustainable because those are the folks that do the day-to-day -day work. That's where the rubber meets the road. So with my focus on reliability, uh, today's presentation, I think, is applicable to any sort of change you're trying to make. So I, I am going to try and change my vocabulary, but I'm likely to fall into reliability speak on occasion. Um, but when I do that, just think about whatever improvement it is that you're trying to do. So whether it's safety improvements or product quality, um, even improving sales, any sort of change, any sort of improvement effort, I think what I'm going to be talking about is, is very relevant. And that's because the nature of change and the resistance to change seems to be fairly universal, no matter what it is that we're talking about. I love this cartoon because I think it, it really encapsulates what it's like to change. Everyone wants change, but very few people want to change. So if you ask a group, hey, who thinks things need to change around here? Every hand in the room is likely to go up. But if you change that question to who thinks they need to change as part of this improvement effort, all the hands go down. 
And if you really want to clear the room, go ahead and ask who wants to lead change, because that's about as challenging as it can get. So one of the, the challenges that I face with this idea of storytelling is in the reliability world, a lot of my audience is highly technical. I'm talking to engineers, I'm talking to mechanics, technicians, and they tell me things like this. You know, look, I, I'm an engineer, I'm a mechanic. Why on earth do I need to know about storytelling? I deal in facts. In my field, the numbers do the talking. And some of you may be thinking the same thing. So I, I wanna test that mindset. So let me ask a question. Have you ever been frustrated trying to get people in your organization to change to a better way of working? Have you ever kind of hit that wall and not been able to break through to people? Or have you ever been frustrated that management isn't supporting your efforts to improve? So great idea. You've got the front line on board, but you can't get management to provide the support. So if, if the numbers really are doing the talking and the numbers support your effort, which I assume they do, otherwise you wouldn't be pursuing it. The question is, why is it still so challenging to get others on board? What I've seen during my 25 years of working in reliability and maintenance is that I've had to spend a tremendous amount of time trying to gain support for improvement work, especially because my product is a board game. Go talk to a refinery manager about playing a game. That, that's a tough sell. And so I followed the advice of, of uh, various people that say, you have to speak the language of the C-suite. If you want management to buy in, you've got to talk dollars and cents. You've got to provide them with all of the data. So I've collected the data. I've sorted it. I've summarized it. I've monetized it. I've graphed it. I've done everything I can to demonstrate how fast they're going to get a return on investment for doing, in my case, defect elimination. But most of the time, they're still not convinced to take action. Management isn't convinced and the front line isn't convinced. And so I've asked myself, what is it that I'm missing? And so that led me down this rabbit hole of trying to figure out how do people make decisions? What is it that influences us? And, and how do those decisions come about? And also what creates a culture inside of an organization? So the research is pretty clear here. Uh, we human beings are not nearly as driven by logic in our decision-making as we like to think we are. Our emotions, our memories, our opinions, our life experiences, all of these things significantly influence how we make decisions. And storytelling is a tried and true way to tap into, into those types of things. There's a reason that the advertising industry is a one $138 billion industry. It works. It's effective. So today I'm going to be talking about the power of storytelling and specifically how we can use it to achieve uh, the goals that we're going after. So again, in my case, it's, it's reliability improvement goals. In your case, it may be something else. Um, but the first thing I want to do is share a quick video with you. Uh, the video has no sound, so you don't need to worry that your speakers aren't working. It, it's just video, no audio. And I want you to watch very carefully because at the end of the video, I'm going to ask you a question about what you witnessed. All right, everybody ready? Yes. All right, here it goes. All right, so that's it. So here's the question that I have regarding what you just witnessed. In this video clip, who was the aggressor? Was it the big triangle, the little triangle, or the circle? 
And if you guys can type in chat, I'm not sure I can see chat. Let's see. We'll let you know what the uh, what the Perfect. conventional wisdom is. Perfect. So who did you guys see as the aggressor? A, big triangle, B, the little triangle, or C, the circle? So far, the trend is A, with a little bit of opinion that it could have been B. But it seems like the big triangle is the, the aggressor. Big triangle is, is the consensus. Well, this was an experiment that was actually run in the 1940s by a couple of experimental psychologists. They shared the video with their undergrad students and they asked them to write down what happened. And then they looked at the results. And so they, they got a lot of different descriptions. The majority of the subjects described the interaction as being between people. They included descriptions of their emotions, their agendas, the conflict, the plot, the resolution. Uh, a lot of people like you guys said, the big triangle was the aggressive bully. Um, some people described it as a love story between the little triangle and the circle. Some saw it as an escape of the, the circle. Um, but some of us saw it very differently. There were a few of them that saw it as, as a home invasion where the little triangle distracted the big one while the circle robbed his home. Um, but the thing that's interesting is the vast majority of people saw a story. Out of all the people they showed this to, there was only one that described it in strictly geometric terms, right? Geometric shapes moving around in two dimensions, which is technically what I just showed you, right? So the test subjects and you guys didn't actually see a story. They created one. More accurately, their brains concocted a story complete with characters and motivations and plot. And they did that because that's what brains do. That's what they are wired to do. That's how our brains are able to cope with and make sense of the massive amount of data that comes into them on a regular basis. Our bodies gather data from our senses and they send about 11 million bits of data per second to our brains. And our senses aren't even very good. So there's a lot that goes on around us that we actually miss. For example, Dogs have 44 times more scent cells than humans have. So we miss a lot of the smells that are around us. And having spent my fair amount of time in subways, I, I'm actually thankful that I don't have dog sense of smell. That would be, be pretty terrible. Our hearing isn't great either. Uh, we hear less than other animals. The best case scenario is that humans hear in the 20 to 20,000 Hertz range. And I say best case scenario, because if any of you are like me, um, over the course of time, we've lost some of that range. Specifically, noise-induced hearing loss usually happens in the 3,000 to 6,000 hertz range. Uh, my husband, David, pictured here, also seems to have some very specific hearing loss in the 165 to 255 hertz range, which <laughs> happens to be the range of the average adult female voice. And he assures me that that's purely coincidental, but I'm, I'm not so sure. Our vision isn't any better. We only see a very small percentage of the electromagnetic spectrum that's out there, just 0.0035%. So even with the limitations of our senses, we still have 11 million bits of data per second coming into our brains. And the problem is with our brain's processing speed. When it comes to things that we already know, and so all we have to do is just recognize it, our speed is about 10, uh, 10 kilobytes per second for auditory input. It's a little bit better for visual than that. But when it comes to learning something new, that's when our processing speed slows down to an absolute crawl. We're able to, to process very little of the things that we're seeing. So to make sense of all of that data and quickly turn it into actionable information, our brains create stories as a type of shortcut. Our brains act less like a computer kind of taking in and crunching data and spitting out data and work a lot more like a movie director, trying to figure out what's going on and to kind of keep our interest as we move through the scenario. So we're biologically wired for story. And if one isn't presented to us, our brains are going to create one. It may be what the presenter speaker is trying for us to see, 
or it might be something entirely different that we've concocted. So when you are, are presenting or trying to, to uh, share your, your thoughts about improvements, if you're not telling a story, the problem is your audience is hearing one. And it may be very different than what it is that you want them to hear. So just like what happened to the students watching the shapes video, what probably happened to you, you're creating a story as all of these inputs are coming in. So in the world of reliability, I've found specific scenarios where storytelling can be extremely helpful. And I think that they apply equally well to most types of change. So the, the three areas where I, I use it most often are one in securing financial and moral support from management for whatever the improvement is that I'm trying to do. The second is for gaining the enthusiastic participation of the front line. So you wanna go kind of beyond malicious compliance. You want them to be doing these new things even when you're not looking, not grading, not, not watching them. And then finally, it, it, storytelling can be very effective in addressing the organization to um, make, the, make the improvement sustainable. And so specifically with reliability, we're looking at creating a proactive culture where people are trying to avoid problems rather than solving things that have already happened. Um, so this is why I think it's important that, that everybody, certainly in the reliability and maintenance world, but I think anybody trying to implement change needs to become a better storyteller. So that's the why. Now I wanna talk about the how, how do you get that done? Um, I come from a long line of Cajun storytellers. Any of you who have spent time in South Louisiana know that is something else. They rarely let the truth get in the way of, of a good story. Uh, this picture is my family, the Lede clan. They're here in my grandfather's kitchen. My, uh, my grandfather, his bestie on his left, my dad's behind him, and my two brothers to the right, my mom's in the background, and uh, nobody knows who the other woman is. <laughs> is in the picture. That, that, that's uncertain, probably a neighbor. So as one of the few introverts in this family of extroverts, I have always been a lot more comfortable listening to the stories and being the, the audience than I ever have been being a storyteller. <clears throat> I share this with you because if this introvert can tell stories and get better at telling stories, then I guarantee all of you can do it as well. And the good news is it, it's not a new skill. It's not something new that you have to learn. You're already a storyteller. It's just a matter of honing those skills and putting them to use in, in a different environment. If you think about when you come home at, at the end of a work day and you uh, meet up with your significant other, your spouse, your kids, whoever's there, and they, they say, how was your day? The answer you give them is a story. Right? You don't break out the spreadsheet. I spent this percent of my time doing this and this percent doing this. You tell a story about what happened that day. Uh, if you ever go to a conference and you run into somebody you haven't seen in six months, eight months, and they say, hey, how have you been? Your answer is likely to be a story. Not only do we tell stories to other people, we also tell them to ourselves. So during a presentation like the one I'm giving now, um, anytime the presenter asks a rhetorical question, it likely triggers a story in your mind. So when I asked earlier, have you ever been frustrated that management isn't supporting your improvement efforts? You probably are thinking, oh yeah, let me tell you all about it. And you've got somebody in mind in a particular scenario in mind. Um, basically, anytime you see something out of the ordinary, uh, maybe a heated discussion in the office, your brain will automatically shift into story mode in order to make sense out of this unexpected thing that you've, you've witnessed. So again, becoming a storyteller isn't about some sort of new skill that you have to learn. It's just refining a skill that you already have. Um, so I, I started digging into this. There are tons and tons of books out there um, that talk all about this. A lot of them for me just got too much into the weeds. So I was really looking for something that was a lot more practical. And I stumbled on this book. It's the Storytelling Code by either Dana Norris or Dana Norris. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, I have no affiliation. I'm, I'm just a huge fan. It's an extremely practical book. It has lots of examples, which is part of, of how I learn. Um, it probably has a little bit more than, than what I needed for my purposes and, and what you'll likely need for yours, but it's also very skimmable. So each chapter is independent. You can read one without having to read the others and still get a lot from it. So uh, Ms. Norris talks about these, these 10 rules 
for better storytelling. I'm not going to talk about all 10, but I will cover four of them that I think are very relevant in the context of, of improvements. All right, so the first rule that I want to talk about is to know your goal. What change is it that you want to inspire by telling the story you're about to tell? And these five questions can help to define your goal. So the first question is, who's your audience? Who is it that you're going to be talking to? The second thing is, what do they already know? What results do you want your story to have? What do you need to communicate in order to achieve those results? What's your audience's current mindset? And how do you want to change that mindset? In the book, Ms. Ms. Norris gives a great example of telling the same story, but to four different audiences and changing it slightly based on the audience you're telling it to. So the story she mentions as an example is getting a flat tire in the middle of the night on your way home one night, side of the, the highway. So if you're telling this story to your boss, your goal might be to show how well you handle obstacles and how you overcome them. So you're going to tell the story a certain way to do that. If you're just hanging out with your friends and, and you want to amuse your friends, telling this funny story about the catastrophe that happened the other night on, on your way home, a little self-deprecating humor, you're going to tell the story very differently because your goal in that case is to just to amuse. Uh, maybe if, if you're on a date, your goal might be to show that you're very capable and that uh, you can take care of yourself. If you're telling a child, if that's your audience, your goal might be to show how important it is to, to always be prepared. So again, the same story can serve all four of these audiences. You're just going to tell the story slightly different depending on who you're talking to. So when we're talking about improvement efforts, I think there are at least three audiences that you should consider. The first is management. Whatever it is that you're trying to do, um, likely you have to get management on board to provide some sort of funding or moral support at least. And they may have a current mindset about cost cutting, right? We're, we're being pressured to reduce how much we spend. And so they're looking for things to cut out, things to not do in order to reduce what they're spending. And the new mindset that you want to inspire them is to look for ways of reducing waste. So rather than just chopping cost, look for ways to reduce waste that will also save money. Another potential audience is going to be the front line, the people that actually have to get the work done. You might need to convince them to change how they're performing certain activities on a, a daily basis. And what I found is their current mindset is often that they feel like bystanders, that other people are making decisions, that they really don't have much of a say in what's going on. They're just a tiny part of a much bigger system. And so you might have to convince them that they are significant contributors to the overall performance of your organization and that what they do really matters and it is incredibly important. The last audience that, that I've identified is the organization itself. And as I mentioned before, to, to sustain an improvement, it's likely that you have to change the organization's culture. And this needs to be, um, in my case, needs to be changed from a reactive one where people are responding to problems and breakdowns to a proactive culture where people are actively looking for ways to improve performance and to avoid problems. All right, so that's the first rule that I wanted to cover. Know your goal and specifically know your audience and recognize that your goal may be different for different audiences. Hey, Michelle, I have a quick question. Yeah. How finite could you get with that previous slide? Meaning, you know, if you if you look at like the management bucket, maybe would you would you potentially consider a different story for like the CFO versus the a, a VP of human resources? Absolutely. It may be a different story or it might be the same story, but told differently. Either one of those are true. And I think very important to, to get down to who am I talking to in this particular situation. You're absolutely right. It, it, um, you have different goals for different audiences and either different stories or different ways of telling the same story, depending on who your target audience is. Awesome. Thank Great you. Great question. Yeah. All right. So the next rule that I want to talk about is you ought to use plot to tell your stories. 
Um, the book uses this simple plot arc, and there are lots of other ones out there. I like this one, again, because it's it's simple. It kind of gets right to the heart of it. You've got time on the horizontal axis, and you have tension on the vertical axis. So the beginning of every story is a description of normal times. It sets the scene. And you need to do this to, to kind of get started to get people's attention. But very quickly, you want to get to the problem. The, our brains are wired to notice change. We don't notice status quo very much, but we notice change. So this is where the story grabs our attention. It's also important at this point to be very clear about why you personally care about this particular problem and by association, why your audience should care about the problem. Now, easy to solve problems are not terribly interesting. They're pretty boring stories. So it's better to have a story that has some trials and tribulations. There are often a few failed attempts to solve the problem, but through it all, you keep going, you keep trying. And that perseverance is, again, the way to get your audience kind of emotionally connected to you, where they want, they want you to succeed. They want there to be a good outcome. The solution is then found. And that is sort of the apex of the tension. Very quickly, the tension drops off and very significantly. But it's important to recognize that the solution is not the end of the story. The author, Dana Norris, says the ending isn't where the story stops. The ending is what the story means. So in the book, she provides a few examples to illustrate. And, and I think, again, examples to me are so much easier to understand than just the theory side of it. So let me just run through one of them quickly with you. Uh, in the classic Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare, the story begins in the Italian town of Verona where there are two important families, the Capulets and the Montagues, and they're in the middle of a longstanding feud. So that sets the scenes, that's the base. Very quickly, we get to the story's problem. Romeo, who's a Montague, falls in love with Juliet, who's a Capulet. And this is something that's not particularly, um, uh, the families are not particularly happy with this. So there's, there's the big rise in tension, the problem that ultimately needs to be solved. There are a lot of failed attempts along the way. Talk about trials and tribulations. A lot of people die. A lot of horrible things happen as, as Romeo and Juliet try to build their relationship in the middle of this family feud. Eventually, Romeo is banished and Juliet fakes her own death in a desperate attempt to be reunited with him. So the climax of the tension in the story is when both Romeo and Juliet die as the result of a tragic misunderstanding. But this isn't where the story ends. The ending isn't the solution, it's the resolution. The solution is the action. The resolution is how the audience feels about it. So in this story, that the ending, again, isn't where the story stops, it's what the story means. And so in the story of Romeo and Juliet, the death of the star-crossed couple makes the family realize the damage and futility of this longstanding feud, and they decide at that point to end it. Now, if Shakespeare isn't your thing, that's okay. Take a look at any of your favorite books or movies, whether it's Star Wars, Lion King, Harry Potter, Hunger Games, guaranteed they all follow this basic plot arc. And you can go pick the key moments for each of, of these spots on the plot arc. It's a tried and true formula that grabs our brain's attention, makes us care about the outcome, and can drive us to take action as a result. And that's what we're looking for. All right, the next rule is you wanna make sure that you wow your audience in the end. Whatever it is that you end your story with is the last thing that they get to hear from you. And so make sure you don't just let it fizzle out. Make sure you're achieving your goal. Make sure you're ending with a, in a strong, well thought out way. And again, this is where a lot of times I think we fail as storytellers because we get to the sort of the exciting part and then we lose steam after that. And it's important that we make that connection at the end to here's why I told you the story. The final rule that I want to cover is, is a pet peeve of mine. Um, make sure your story makes your point. I have a, a colleague and a very dear friend, not Bob Latino. <laughs> my friend is not currently on, the, on this call, um, but my friend really struggles with this particular point. 
he gets so buried in the detail and the minutia of a story that by the time he's finished telling it, you have absolutely no idea why he told you the story. And I'm convinced he doesn't know either. It's just become sort of word salad at that point. The key here is, is balance. You do have to provide enough detail to draw people in, to make them care about what you're talking about. But you have to make sure that it's not so much detail that you lose your point and you lose your audience along with it. So when you're thinking about the stories that you wanna tell in, in support of your change effort, remember to know your goal and specifically know who your audience is. Use plot to tell your story. Make sure you come up with a, a great ending that's really gonna catch their attention and help you achieve your goal. And make sure you actually make your point that it's not a story just for the sake of telling stories. It's not about just telling war stories. There's a reason you're telling the story. And, and so make sure you get to that point. Um, if you wanna learn more about the 10 simple rules, because again, I think all 10 of them are great. There were just four of them that I thought were important to cover. Um, the book's available on Amazon. I've got the QR code there. Happy to share a link with anybody if, if you want it later on. All right, so now I've talked about why you should tell stories and I've given you some tips on how to tell a good story. I wanna wrap up by telling you a story about what ultimately led me into the field of reliability. So my reliability journey started a long, long time ago when I was born to a PhD chemical engineering student named Winston Lede. He was a nerd's nerd. This is a picture of him from his early days at DuPont. And if you look carefully, you will notice the pocket protector, very important tool for every good engineer. So dad worked at DuPont for the first 27 years of his career. And during that time, he experienced a profound life-changing moment when he visited one of the sites in Orange, Texas in his capacity as a regional technical lead. He was talking to a lead operator named Butch and he was trying to convince him to participate in the reliability initiative that my dad and his team were spearheading, which was called Pumps Running. And Butch listened politely for a while and then finally looked at my dad and said, you know, Winston, you're not the only one that shows up here wanting me to work on your pet project. It sure would be nice if you corporate guys would get together and integrate all of these different things you want us to do and put it out as a single process instead of making me figure out how to put all this stuff together. And this had a huge impact on my dad because he had always valued the opinions coming from the field. The insight led my dad and his team to look for a way to do exactly what Butch was asking. The result was they created the manufacturing game as a way to integrate planning and scheduling, safety and environmental performance improvements, materials management, and defect elimination. All of the different things that different groups were asking for, they put that into the simulation so that it all became one thing that they were asking the field to do. In addition to the technical side of reliability, the game also included the human side. And that was something that, that uh, Butch's comments really um, revealed to my dad was that that human side is every bit as important as the technical side and it's often overlooked. So a decade later, after my dad started doing this, that passion for improving the human side of reliability is what inspired me to join forces with him. And after he retired from DuPont, I started working with him on his second career of bringing the power of defect elimination to organizations outside of DuPont. One of the first things that I did in, in this part of my career was uh, working with a chemical company not DuPont, that was uh, trying to improve their reliability. And so I was there in, in a support role. And so we started, we did a workshop with about 40 people, all different levels in the organization from frontline up through senior management. And on the second day of the workshop, we divided them into small groups that we call action teams. And we tasked each group of four to six people with picking a defect, something that wasn't working right at, at their site, at their area, and working together to eliminate that defect at its source. So not just coming up with a Band-Aid temporary fix, but making that problem go away. So the action team that I was assigned to was, was headed up by a lead operator named Mickey. And they had selected a technical equipment issue that I, I don't remember anymore, um, but it required that they go out and gather some data and get back together to review the data that, 
try and figure out where the, the issues were coming from. Now you need to understand this was in the early 90s, um, back before we had easy access to computerized data, before we had laptops and uh, projectors that hooked up to them and, and uh, all the easy things that we have today. We certainly didn't have Zoom, so you couldn't, couldn't Zoom it with them. Um, back in these days to share data with a group, you had to actually create a transparency and display it on an overhead projector. Now, there are probably some people here on the on this call that are a bit younger than myself, and so maybe you're not familiar with it, but this is an overhead projector. Back in the old days, this is what we used to use. Um, so you would write on transparent film. If you were super fancy, you figured out how to print on transparent film. You place the film on the glass, you turn the power on, the light in the base would shine, bounce off of a mirror, through the transparency, off another mirror, and then be projected onto the screen. So after Mickey had gathered all of his data and he had painstakingly handwritten it all on transparencies, he reconvened his group in a meeting room that was very near the control room where he worked. He put his transparency on the projector glass, he turned it on, he looked at the screen, and it was really blurry and out of focus. But you had to give these machines a chance to warm up. So Mickey sat there and waited for a few minutes to give the light bulb a chance to get to, to full brightness here. And, and he looked and still blurred. So he starts messing with the knobs, trying to get it in focus and messing with the mirrors to see if he can get it in focus. He's scooting the projector closer to the screen and further away. Nothing works. After 15 minutes of doing this with everybody else on the team just staring at Mickey, he gave up. Completely frustrated, embarrassed, and angry at this point, he threw down the proverbial gauntlet. And he said to his team, if they're serious about wanting us to work on improvements, then they should be giving us the tools that we need to do the job. So the new topic of our action team is to get a new overhead projector for this room that actually functions so that we can do the rest of our work. And when they turn that down, because I know they're going to, well, then I'm done. Because if they're not serious about it, why should I be serious about it? At this point, he stormed out of the room, wrote up a purchase request for a new overhead projector, stomped into his, his supervisor's office and threw it down on Steve's desk and said, here you go. And you know, here's your defect elimination project and whatever. You know, if you don't approve it, then I'm done. So Steve's initial reaction when he looked at it is, well, this is kind of ridiculous. Um, overhead projectors are expensive. We've got several others on site. Mickey can just use a different room or bring one of those projectors into his room. Um, but fortunately, Steve saw how passionate Mickey was and understood how important this was to him. Um, he also decided that given Mickey's frustration, the safest answer would be to go ahead and sign the purchase order and get Mickey his new projector. So he did that. New projector arrived several weeks later. This is before Amazon Prime two-day delivery, so they had to wait a while for it to come in, but it did come in. At that point, Mickey was kind of surprised, so he got it all set up. He got his team back together, back in the original room, and they discussed the original project. They reviewed the data, came up with some possible solutions, and then went back out in the field to implement those solutions. Um, when they were done, they got back together to review the results, and, and sure enough, you know, they had, they had made a big difference. The performance had gotten a lot better for the particular piece of equipment that they were working on. And so as part of this review process, one of the team members said, you know, there's, there's another opportunity. There's something else that I think that we could work on. And he described the, the issue, and the team said, yeah, that sounds great. And they took that project on, had success with that, got back together, came up with something else. And then there was another one and another one and another one. Eventually, over the course of 15 months, this one team of six people managed to identify 157 defects in their area, and they had eliminated almost half of them, and they were continuing to work on the ones that they hadn't eliminated, and they were continuing to identify additional defects. Bottom line on this is their effort saved $1.8 million for the company. So over the course of 15 months, doing small improvement projects, they were able to generate a verified $1.8 million worth of savings. So I've now reached the climax in the tension of my story. I've described the action that became the solution. But as I mentioned, the ending requires resolution. 
how do I want my audience to feel about the solution to this story? And that depends on who my audience is. So if I'm talking to a management group, at this point, my ending would be something like this. But none of this improvement would have happened if Steve had turned down that original purchase request for the overhead projector. Now, he might have done that for good reasons, to prevent wasteful spending. That would make perfect sense. But had he done that, it would have eliminated Mickey's enthusiasm, and they would not have gone after the improvement projects that they did. So as a management group, we need to be willing to have the confidence in our frontline workforce and give them the freedom to pursue improvements that are important to them and provide them with the support and the funding that they need. So that would be my goal for the management group. If I'm talking to a frontline group, it's going to be different. In this case, what I'm looking for is participation. So I would end with something like this. What you do matters. These seemingly small victories add up. Not only does it provide return for the company, but more importantly, it makes for a better day at work for each and every one of you. So we need your help. We need you to participate. We need to know the defects that you see, and we need your help in making those defects go away. And the last audience I talked about was for the organization as a whole. If that's who I was speaking to, then I would go a step further. I would add this slide and say, you know, there are many definitions out there of organizational culture, and this is one that resonates with me. Organizational culture can be defined as the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. So in reactive organizations, we're really good at telling disaster stories with traditional firefighting heroes. When everything goes wrong, these are the folks that fly in with their cape and save the day. And that's still going to happen. When things go wrong, we still need those reactive heroes. But if we want to change as an organization, if we want to become a proactive organization, we need to get better at telling the stories of the proactive heroes like Mickey the people who avoid problems rather than the people who rescue us from the problems we've gotten ourselves into. At Mickey's, at, at Mickey's site, as they continue to work on implementing defect elimination, this, his story of the overhead projector got told over and over again. Um, it eventually helped to define the organizational culture that actively supported proactive defect elimination and efforts from everybody at the site, not just from a select group. And so, you know, when a skeptic would grumble and say something like, you know, they say they want us to make these improvements, but as soon as it costs them a nickel, you know, they're going to find some way to kill it. Invariably, somebody would counter with Mickey's story and they would say, you know, I used to think that too, but this is what happened with Mickey and they supported him. They value these improvements. And if, if we're willing to do the work, they're willing to support us. So it created this different type of culture. But today, I have a very different audience. My audience are you guys. And the result that I want is for all of you to use storytelling as an improvement tool, as a change tool. So in addition to communicating the technical details of whatever your improvement effort is, I want to inspire you to also address the soft, squishy, messy human side of whatever your issue is. I assume that many of you maybe came to this session a, a bit skeptical, a little bit of a skeptical mindset. I hope that you now see the power of storytelling and you feel confident that it's a skill that, that you can master and that you can use in support of, of your efforts. So for you guys, I'm going to end my story with this. Imagine if I had skipped Mickey's story entirely and had just shared with you the basic facts. If I'd done that, it would have looked something like this. And if I were really doing this right, if I were doing it live, I would now stand in front of the projector so that half of the slide was on my face and you really couldn't read it, but you'll just have to use your imagination here, right? So what if, what if I put this up and I said, you know, I know you can't read this, but it's a list of 73 completed defect elimination projects and they saved $1.8 million. The data clearly shows that defect elimination is a very effective approach to improving reliability. 
So I recommend that you all try this at your sites. If that had been the way that I shared this site's defect elimination success with you, would you remember it tomorrow? If you didn't know more about the story, would you care about it? Would you be inspired to take action? Would this spreadsheet and the graphs have the same impact on you as the story that I told about Mickey and his projector? If your answer to any of these questions is no, the next time you have new ideas for improvement, I, I hope that you're gonna go beyond just sharing the facts with your organization, whether that's the, the organization as a whole, the management team, the frontline workforce, or anyone else who happens to be your audience. Pick a story to share with them that makes them care as much about the opportunity for improvement as you do, that makes them far more likely to say yes to whatever action it is that you need for them to take in order to achieve your goals. All right, so as you can see, this is a topic that I'm, I'm pretty passionate about. Um, I, I love the soft, squishy side of reliability, uh, and that I'm the odd man out typically in a world full of engineers and, and uh, numbers folks. Um, if you want to know more about our story, uh, we do have a book. We kind of took our own advice and we wrote a book about our story and defect elimination. It's called Don't Just Fix It, Improve It. It's available on Amazon. Um, and it is in story form. So it has all the technical details of how to implement a defect elimination program, but it's done with story. And again, I think much more effective way than, uh, than just the facts and, and figures. I've also got my email on here. I have my LinkedIn information. I'm very active on LinkedIn. So feel free to reach out to me there. Um, and of course, happy to answer any questions now. Uh, Thank you. I, I quickly want to bring up uh, Michelle that we uh, we she's unique with me in the sense that we have to reconcile dictionaries because of where we come from. So uh, as you can tell that in the uh, from the late seventies to early eighties into the nineties that uh, reliability to us involved the research and development of equipment process and human reliability, and certainly you can see now the correlation between. Uh, learning teams as they're expressed now and the similarities between defect elimination teams is that a, a lot of our, the purposes of why we do the things that we do are very similar. Uh, yeah. So while we may call them different names, conceptually, we're all on the same page. And uh, I think that your excellent presentation uh, reinforces uh, that, that, you know, th these, these concepts have been around a while, but it's yeah. all a matter of uh, if, if how well we execute them or not. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, like I mentioned, Bob, I think sometimes they get lost in the technical shuffle that, yeah. uh, you know, one of the things that I've, I've heard recently that I think is, is so appropriate is the soft stuff is the hard stuff. A lot of times the technical answers are actually the easy part of getting an improvement done. It's the convincing people to, to participate and, um, being good about getting input from everyone. You know, we tend to go out in the field and say, we know the answer here, do this. And we're not necessarily very good listeners. Um, and, and turns out we don't have all the information and, and we don't understand necessarily the what the, the human side is that the operators and mechanics in, in my case are facing. That, that's one thing that we're looking at too, is that she's mentioned this the manufacturing game. And it really is an experience. I mean, if anybody has played this 20, 30 years ago, you're still going to remember the principles of that because it's not like monopoly uh, you're getting wrenches thrown at you all the time about the uh the supply chain has been interrupted the uh, you got a customer complaint uh you know you've had an explosion uh, you know all of those things are thrown in at different times uh but uh we're looking at potentially uh trying to entice the manufacturing game to come into the uh the, the coal learning world and uh at our 30th conference next year, deciding whether uh, we can uh, do that. So if, uh, if anyone was interested in that, just please make it known. Yeah, you know, one of the things that, that I think would be interesting if we have a chance to do that is, you know, obviously if there are any reliability and maintenance people um, in the community, it would be a direct link. But we've actually, uh, we've actually worked with the government. So after 9-11, they were trying to figure out how to get interagency 
cooperation and they wanted to create their own board game to do that. And so they had us come in and run the manufacturing game just as a way to see how a board game can be used as a learning tool. And so when uh, we finished, we were debriefing and I thought most of the debrief was going to be about sort of the technical components of a game and how you make it work and the do's and don'ts. They were able to actually make connections from the game itself to what they do in the field. You know, so they talked about you know, a, a breakdown is if they've got an agent out in the field whose cover's blown, and now they've got to deal with that. And they talked about a plan job as being, you know, how do they avoid having a, an agent's cover blown? And so they were able to actually make a lot of connections to the specifics in the game. Um, because again, I think there's there's some very uh, broad principles that underlie it. And so if you if you use your imagination a little bit, it actually applies to a lot more than just maintenance and reliability. Was, was that the, I think I was at that one. That, that was with the NSA and DC and Booz Allen Hamilton. Yep. yep. So In we have, <laughs> it was <laughs> exciting. We have about seven minutes left. So let's uh, see if anybody wants to chat into the chat box or just raise a hand and, and ask any questions or make any comments. And while we're waiting for that to happen, Michelle, I have one quick question then I'm going to go to um, a comment in the chat box, but Here's my question. So like a big part of my background is data analytics, Six Sigma stuff, and and storytelling wasn't always natural. Yeah. Is this a skill that can be practiced and enhanced? I think that's a bit of a leading question, but like if, it, if I'm not comfortable with it, do I, or even if I am comfortable with telling stories in this way, you know, is it a skill that I need to practice and, and work on? Absolutely. And so I, I have advice. Let me start with all of my extroverted family and friends. <laughs> you need to practice. <laughs> you need to take the time to think about what's my goal, who's my audience, because sometimes you make your point and sometimes you, you get so wrapped up in the story that you kind of lose, lose your way. So even if you're an extrovert, even if you're very comfortable with storytelling, take the time to sit down and, and think through specifically the, the four points that, that I mentioned to make sure you're telling your the right story to the right group in the right way to achieve your goals. Yeah, what um, do I do? Do I record that on an iPhone video or something and play it back or do I do it with a colleague? How do I do it? It depends. I was gonna say for the introverts, I would take it a step further. Make sure you practice out loud mm. because the, when you're saying it in your head, it, it's not the same when it comes out of your mouth and there are things that just don't work, you know, and, and so it's very important to do it out loud. You can do it in an empty room. You can do it to a mirror. You can do it to your dog or your spouse. Um, my go-to is my mom, who I believe is on this call. Thank you, mom, for listening. <laughs> um, whoever will listen. And, and again, recording it, Dean, is a great option. You know, if you've got, if you've got Zoom, uh, a Zoom account, on your computer, you can actually just record it that way so that you can you can see what it's like and, and how it, it fits if you're using slides. Um, I definitely recommend practicing out loud, especially if you're an introvert. Thank you, thank you. And one, so another quick question, well, before I go to the chat or anybody raising their hands is, you know, so storytelling, you know, communicating in that way in person is one thing, but now we're in this world post pandemic of we're doing a lot of zoom so is there what's the value of making eye contact with the camera versus you know in zoom we have the hollywood squares and sometimes we tend to look down here and talk to the hollywood square or talk to the slide versus trying to make eye contact is it how important is that to make eye contact in in a virtual world I think it's extremely important. To, and as a presenter, the challenge I have in the virtual world is it drives me crazy to not get feedback. You know, when I'm in a room with people, I can tell, are they listening? Are they not listening? Are they sleeping? Um, it, you know, are people nodding their head because they they uh, are connecting with what I'm saying? Are they giving me a weird look? So maybe maybe I need to explain something differently because I'm not, I'm not being clear in what I'm saying. Um, so I struggle with with the virtual world because I think it's a much more challenging way to present, but it's something that we all need to get better at because it's here to stay. You know, it's it's the new way of doing things for sure. Yeah, and it certainly I, is. Eye contact is vital. Um, as a participant, I would say be a good participant, right? Do uh, we have a an obligation as presenters to be good presenters? But there's also an obligation as a participant to be a good participant. So listen, ask questions. 
um, you know, those sorts of things. That, that makes a big difference. And uh, Tanya Hewitt, I'm glad you raised your hand because I was just going to try to paraphrase what you shared in, in chat, and there's no way I'm able to do that. So Tanya, <laughs> what are your thoughts? Well, thank you, Michelle, for the for an excellent talk. Uh, but I just wanted to to maybe bring up a different perspective. Um, lies, damn lies, and statistics have been out there forever, and and the reason why we say that statistics can be misleading is because of the choices that the statisticians make in order to present the data that they do. But the same can be said of storytellers, and. I mean, we do have to pay attention to who designed the story because they are making choices about what they want you to hear. And this is what Professor Brooks had had said, and that's what I put in the chat, that we've gotten to a point where actually we don't question stories anymore. Just so as long as it's told in a story, then I know what happened. I know the truth. But that it's is told by... <laughs> an interlocutor who is, who has, as you said, a goal, who has a message. I mean, it, con, you know, national narratives are built this way. Wars, uh, look at what Putin has done. Look at what Hitler did. Like, all of this is all built on this, the storytelling narrative, basically, that you've presented. So I'm just making sure that people realize there are different perspectives to this. The overall message is, don't ever turn your brain off. Like you have to be critically analyzing statistics, stories, any information that you come across. Yeah, I, I absolutely I'll add, agree. I'll add on that, Tanya, that the, that's also uh, equally important as to the recipient of the story uh, to challenge the story. Because yeah, yeah, certainly I'm going to be biased to the way that I am telling the story and the, the persons receiving it shouldn't be naive enough just to accept it, but to challenge it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, be be good listeners, right? Be be uh, be a good audience, and and be paying attention to um, what is this story telling me, and and what is the perspective of the person telling the story. Um, that doesn't mean don't tell stories, though. I, I will say that that just saying okay because of that, all I'm going to do is show data. Well, showing data is telling a story as well, right? How you choose to show the data tells a story. So people are hearing a story, whether you're telling it or not. Um, you, you ought, so you ought to make sure that you're telling the story that, that you want your audience to hear. That said, there's, what is it? Is it Google's uh, theme of don't be evil? Um, it, it's, a, it's a tool like anything else. It can be used for good or it can be used for evil. And, and so be sincere, right? Only, only tell stories that are true. Only tell um, stories in support of things that you actually believe in that, that you think people should be doing. But that, I think that's very important. Yeah, Don, thanks for bringing that up, Tanya. And thanks for the uh, commentary and, and insights, Michelle. And uh, Tanya, also, thank you. I just wrote, don't ever turn your brain off on a big yellow sticky and put it in the front of my Mac. Good reminder every day. A <laughs> um, couple more, or, so Michelle, do you have a couple more minutes for two more? Sure. So there was a, a question in the chat box about, was there ever a real story behind the triangles and circles? So interesting question. Um, I, I have my personal opinion. I've never found anything in particular that it wasn't just random movements, right? Somebody choreographed the movements of those shapes and, and they probably had a story in mind. Um, but the fact of the matter is it, it shapes moving on a two-dimensional plane. So different right. people will see different stories. Yeah. yeah. And Brett commented just, and it got to the point of, or I think Brett is getting to the point of um, your thoughts and insights that you shared about really considering your audience and the sub audiences, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, the and telling, telling the story, sharing the story in different ways from the different audiences involved, the different stakeholder groups involved. So Brett, thanks for putting that in there. Um, so with that, it looks like we are out of questions or comments in the chat box. Michelle, thank you. And let me, I think Bob had mentioned, let me see if I can get it to come up. Um, if anybody is interested in the manufacturing game from a uh, reliability perspective, or even just a, there's some other change I want to do. And I wonder if a game would be something I could, could use to, to uh, do that. 
We do have a public session, as Bob mentioned, coming up in October, and we don't do public sessions very often, so this is kind of a big deal for us. And so if anybody's interested, it's in the, the Richmond, Virginia area. Is that right, Bob? Chester's yeah, yeah. near Richmond. What we're trying to do, at least I'm trying to do in our local community, which is uh, in central Virginia that doesn't really get national speakers or anywhere around here, is to work with our community college system and the Chamber of Commerce by providing a way for people to economically preview the game before deciding whether they wanted to do anything further with it. So this is kind of a new model that we're trying, and if it works, we'll probably bounce around to different community, smaller communities that can't get uh, access to these types of things. So uh, thank you for that, and uh, it's, it's been a fun collaboration too. So if All I right. scan the QR code, that'll give me more info. That yeah, the QR code will give you more information on it. Awesome. Well, with that, Michelle, thank you so much for thank you for your time. Thanks for your your wisdom and your coaching. We really appreciate that. And thanks everybody for taking the time to join us and and for a good dialogue today.